Hey everybody, welcome to day two of the Sphera Managing Data Workshop. Um, today we'll dive into a curation mini project. Um, and yeah, we saw that a lot of you have already completed the preparation stuff, including assigning yourselves to issues on GitHub. Um, if you want to work on a curation mini project today and you don't have a data set yet, um, try use like the next like 30, 40 minutes um, where we still go over the basics of the curation process. Um, just pick a data set on GitHub and assign yourself for a comment. Cool. Um, so um, yesterday we went over um, general Sphero data API components that allow you to interact with data. Um, so including downloading data, streamlining data, loading data, streaming data, um, essentially everything that involves consuming data in that sense. And today um, we'll do a short introduction to our curation toolkit, which is essentially um, the set of tools that we use to produce these curated data that you would have used with the API components of day one. And then go into the curation mini project, which means that each of you will try to curate the data that corresponds to one study. So that is what we call one data loader. Then later today, uh, we have a brief session on how you can use these data loaders, so the curated data, to publish h 5 ids to Cyber Gene with uh, Jason from the Cyber Gene engineering team as an invited speaker. And then lastly, we have a really short wrap up of the workshop. So before we start with the introduction, which is going to be slide based, um, do make sure that you have Sphere version open 3.12. So we updated this a few hours ago again. Um, if you were planning to use Docker, you can just run this Docker, uh, Docker command that we posted here to update your Docker in the background. Um, if you use Conda, you can just pull Sphere again and install it. Just let us know if you have questions there. It's, it should be relatively quick also. Just um, keep that in mind that you want to use version 3.12. Now, so this introduction is going to be site-based. Um, I run you through what a data loader is. So what are the exact file components? Um, how are they structured? How do you build them? Um, feel free to ask questions anytime. Again, we'll use this format where we'll moderate questions that you ask in the chat or in Slack. Um, as we go through this, you can also ask stuff at the end. Then later when we do the curation project, so that's gonna be more similar to the tutorials yesterday. But now this time we all sit in breakout rooms um, and really just help you with um, figuring out the exact curation bits that are specific to your data set or your problem. So there you have a ton of opportunity to ask questions that are very specific to the scenario that you're working on. So to the specifics of a data loader or the creation process. This diagram on the right, uh, we also saw yesterday. So we have uh, three cloud entities that you usually interact with in blue, which are the raw data provider, Sarah GitHub, the Yields data loaders, and the curated data provider that you can optionally interact with. All of them are interfaced by the dataset class, which you may remember from yesterday from the session universe and dataset API. And now um, this session today and the curation project later is about writing this block here, the data loader B, um, which has loading code and metadata. Now, specifically, um, this data loader is a Python file that contains the loading code. So you'll later see us refer to this as the .py file. Um, and it is secondly metadata, which consists of a .yaml file, which is something it's sort of like a text file format that's very intuitively readable um, and TSV files that contain metadata maps. Um, yeah. So PI, YAML and TSV files are like the core components of one data loader. So the code that you use to define one study. Um, now you'll see now that um, as we go over these components one by one, 
um, that this is mostly text. Like we really have very little um, high level code in there. So the .py file is just a function. YAML and TSV files are essentially text files where you just like write in words with the text editor. So it's really like very, very low level coding and you hardly have to have any Python experience. There is a lot of um, high performance code in the backend. So when the data load is used by the dataset class, we use these components, but they're shared across all data sets. You, you'll never get to see them and never have to like worry about them. So um, PyFi, YAML file, TSV file, there's a fourth file, the init file. Um, you don't really have to worry about that one because it's the same for every loader. Um, just mentioning it once so that you know it exists and it always has to be there. If just by chance, um, and we didn't actually compare the participant list. If you also attended the Sphere workshop last year, uh, you'll notice that um, what we introduce now, so these um, three components, PI, YAML, and TSV, this is simplified compared to what we had last year. Last year, we had a very similar structure, but in a Python class. Um, and we broke that down into these files um, so that the code that you actually have to write is very similar to scripting code. So something that you would have in a, a cell in a Jupyter notebook, for example, when you load data. Uh, so just in case you were there last year, we still use some of these class-based loaders like last year. So what we have here is sort of like fully uh, backwards compatible, um, but we are pushing this new version of writing it because it's a lot easier to deal with for people who just started out curating and for us also to refer. So what are these files exactly? ID.py, so ID would be the data set ID that is something that comes out of, um, we are starting the curation process that we'll see later. So the Python file has a couple of import statements on the top here, which are modules that we need. And then it defines one single component, which is a load function that has this signature. So this is always going to be the same. Um, you don't have to, yeah. So the data is essentially the idea where your data is going to live. So you can just assume that Sphira gives you the right directory there. And then sample fund is something, so sample file name is something that we'll come to later. And then in this load, uh, we essentially just define a couple of statements to load a maximally raw undata instance into memory. So if your data is an H5 ID file, so the on-disk format of undata, you can literally call a single line calling that into memory in the load and returning it. That would be fine. If your data is like, I don't know, like spread over MTX and text files with like metadata here and count metrics there, then maybe this is like a few lines. Um, sometimes, uh, data set authors sort of like hide some cellwise metadata and observation names, and then you sort of have to dig it out. But there's like very little scripting code here that you would put here to generate sort of the, really think of it as the minimum viable undata that you can reasonably produce for the raw data that you have. And we'll see a couple of examples later. Brief recap of uh, what an undata is, just in case you're not super familiar with that. So let's say that the raw files that we start from are like, as mentioned before, maybe like MTX files, or like some sparse matrix format or H5IDs, or it could even be R objects. Um, and undata is a Python representation of single cell data uh, that's popular in the ScanPy environment and like generally packages related to ScanPy. At its core, it has a data matrix in a attribute.x, which you're going to also populate with the data that you read in. And then it has uh, feature-wise metadata, observation-wise metadata, and data set-wise metadata are structured. And these are generally fields we can control by setting metadata attributes in Sphere data loaders, which we'll come to in a bit. But importantly, this object always looks like this. And at the time of loading it, it will really be unstructured. So there's going to be metadata flying around in ops, um, maybe different layers of count matrices. There can be a lot of stuff happening here. And by no way do you need to like try to make that somehow streamlined or structured and load. This is all what Sphira does. And this is all what you define in the YAML. 
which brings us to the YAML. Uh, so the YAML um, is something that you can read as a text file. Um, I have the structure here on the right, and then we'll go into each of these sections. So there's a section that defines the data set structure, which uh, with a bunch of items. Um, then a section with data set wise metadata. So these are metadata always defined on the data set level, and you can populate those items there. Then there's layers. This describes the gene expression matrices or the for attack, it would be the peak matrices, but the signal sort of that is measured with the next generation, uh, with the next generation sequencing experiment through alignment, sort of through counting reads to some entity. So that's layers. Um, and then we have four sections that are data set or feature and feature wise. Um, both are attributes that define features. Um, data set or feature wise are attributes that are sometimes defined across the entire data set. So think of a feature type, for example, it could be that the entire data set, so the entire count matrix is RNA observations. Um, that would be data set or feature wise. Uh, whereas an example for feature wise would be a, a feature name, so G name. So that's always defined for one feature. It cannot be defined for a whole data set. So this just breaking it down into these four sections gives you. Um, yeah, some structure because it's a bunch of items and that's similar for data set or observation wise and observation wise. These are metadata that are either defined for each observation of the entire data set or always per observation. So think of an example. Um, cell type is a uh, metadata item that is mostly defined per cell, um, but there's um, there's data sets where this is actually defined on the data set level in terms of simplicity, right? Like if you purify a cell population, maybe with FUX, um, and then run single cell RNA seq on it, then you will have T cell as a single metadata attribute of the entire data set because you purified T cells. So that's the broad architecture of the YAML. So this is the first bit. This is exactly also what you're going to see when you work on the data loader later, especially in phase 1B and 2B, if you started looking at our phase system um, in your code editor. So top bit is the data set structure. Um, this is very small. Essentially, the only thing you need to care about is sample file names, so sample underscore fn. This is something that you need if you write data loaders for multiple data sets, which we'll come to a bit later. Then data set wise, so this is meta, uh, data defined for the entire data set. The leading author, this we need to name the loader. Um, if there's an embedding defined for the set, so that could be UMAP, for example. This is given later to frameworks that do plotting of embeddings, like Sabadine, for example. DOIs, so the DOI intuitively is defined for the entire data set, right? Because it's published with that study. Download URLs, these are used for automatic download and sphere, whether it's primary data um, and then the year of publication. Now, um, all of these attributes and also the remaining, I'm essentially doing like a skim over these attributes. Um, all of these also defined on our read the docs. So you can always go back to the read the docs later and check what one of them exactly means or how it should be filled. Um, the purpose of this now is really just to expose you to all of them once so that you have a rough idea of what's out there. Next is the layer split. So whereas the count matrix is an RNA seq or the peak signal matrices and things like attack. Um, there we have a layer for counts. So these are integers, right? So this is in most cases the most desired format of the data because it's the least process, it's the closest to the aligner. Um, then there's processed. This is often desirable to have in addition to counts to produce meaningful plots if you need to do complex batch correction to adjust the gene expression values, for example. Then we support splice and unsplice counts here, and both of them as counts and process data. Uh, this is something that you use for RNA velocities, part of the multimodal capacity of Sphira data loaders. Um, similarly, we also uh, support direct entries, so estimates of velocity as of uh, RNA velocities here. So these are all layers or dot x or dot raw, so positions in the A data where you can put data matrices, and you can just say what you have and put it there. 
Now we get to these four blocks that are always defined per data set or per feature slash per observation, or really um, always per feature or per observation. Let's start with the per feature um, or per data set ones. So the reference that this was aligned to can be and is mostly defined for the entire data set. So that's a GTF file essentially that's published by Ensemble. Um, in some cases, you may have aligned to two separate references um, or that, I mean, there could have been like separate alignments or it could have been one alignment to like a joint reference. Um, for example, if you align um, data from an infected sample to the host genome and the viral genome, for example, then you may want to define the reference of each feature, right? Because this defines genes or features, then you might want to define that per feature. So that would be var key, which indicates that this will be defined per feature. So here the dist uh, distinguish or the distinction is feature reference is set or feature reference var key is set. Over the entire data set, per feature. Similar for feature type, um, right? You could have multi data where some of the features are RNA and some of the features are peaks and they're just like concatenated in one big matrix. Um, then you would need to define the feature type as a var key that says features one to 20,000 are RNA and the next 200,000 are peaks. Um, if you have a standard single cell RNA experiment, the feature type would be RNA across all of the features. Now, similar now for the ones that are observation wise or defined for the entire data set. This is a ton, and this is like the key effort, arguably, in uh, the curation process to figure out um, which of these are defined, if they're defined, where they're defined, or what they should be, like how they should be set. Um, similar to the base one and Vaki one before, now we also have a base one and an ops key, which means if you set the base one, this is defined across the entire data set. If you define the prefix uh, ops key, so observation key, which means the key of that item in the dot ops table, in an data instance, um, then that information should be there in that column essentially. Uh, I briefly fly over the individual entries here, um, just so that you have an idea of what's out there. Just keep in mind, this is always defined per observation or per data set. So SA, uh, SA underscore SC is SA single cell. This is the protocol used to run single cell experiments, for example, a particular chemistry or something like this. Um, SA differentiation is uh, used in, um, yeah, in vitro differentiation experiments. Type differentiation also rela uh, relates to in vitro differentiation. Biosample is the biological sample, so like a notion of biological replicate in a study. Uh, cell line, if it's a cell line experiment and the, you're supplied the name of that cell line. Cell type is the cell type annotation. Development stage is um, in human often the age, for example, or more generally the development stage of an organism that you're sampling. Um, disease, if it's a disease sample, so which disease? Um, ethnicity is only defined for human samples. Uh, GM is genetic modification, if there's any. Individual is a coherent genotype. So for example, um, in one con matrix, you have data from six patients. So if the assignment of sets to patients is defined, then you can drop it in the, uh, in the individual upscape. And that may help people to do more reasonable batch correction, for example. Um, organ, so the tissue slash organ, the anatomical structure sampled. Organism, the main organism that is sampled. Uh, sample source. Um, Primary tissue would be like generally like tissue that's coming from an organism, but you may also run things that are on ACP on organoids or like cell culture or something like this. Uh, the sex of the organism sampled, uh, source DRI, um, if this is a meta study, and we'll come to that in a second. And here you can essentially indicate where these cells are coming from if they have previously been published, and this is the reanalysis. State exact is a free text field for you to just like add additional information about a cell or about a sample. You don't have to set it, but yeah, it's, it's there if it's interesting, essentially. 
Text sample is the notion of a technical replicate or a technical sample, and use that in contrast to bio sample for biological replicates or biological samples. Um, and then lastly, treatment um, for, for example, a small molecule treatment, um, any kind of like simulation experiment, like there may be like variation in this data set where like some of the states were stimulated, some were not stimulated. You can drop this metadata there for other people to use. Now, some of these are regularized by ontologies. So some of them you can essentially only put uh, values here that are symbols, so like human readable names in an ontology. This is, for example, the case for SASC. So here there's a specific ontology called EFO, um, and specifically a subset of EFO that regularizes how a single cell assays should be called. And this helps us in looking for data later, right? Because um, if I call a site seek, I don't know, like it's written here, right? Like capital site minus seek, and then with an identifier of uh, what the labeling um, uh, was yielding. Um, and then somebody else called side seek or lowercase side seek without a minus, then it becomes very hard to find data sets, right? So for this reason, we enforce ontologies here. Um, for SASC, this is the case. Um, for a bunch of the rare ones, it's, it's also the case. And the major ones um, we'll go over today are for cell type, it is the case. So we map cell types to ontologies. Uh, specifically, um, the specific one we use is called CL. Developmental stage, we use one for human and mouse. Uh, for disease one, uh, for ethnicity one, uh, organ, obviously organism, right? Like these letter names are structured. Uh, for sex, we use one. It's a subset of the PATO ontology. Um, and then, that was the last one, I think. Yeah, exactly. That's the ones I wanted to talk about. Yeah, I think we also mentioned that in a bit again. But so um, some of these are structured by ontologies. Some of them are not. Um, let's look into, um, I'll show um, a YAML here of um, a data loader that we've already written. So you see that we didn't set all of the metadata, right? So we didn't have access to all of them or they were not applicable necessarily. So for example, here, um, you see that organ is set as bone marrow, which means that this entire data set was from bone marrow. We don't need to define it per se. Um, this also means that there's no need for attributes that define cell lines, right? So differentiation, for example, just because it's not applicable here. In contrast to the organ one, um, for example, cell type and ethnicity are described per se, probably because they vary across the cells in this count matrix, right? Um, so here we essentially use both of these uh, strategies of annotating metadata, either across the data set, which is very simple and very like easy to read, or uh, we use the ops key for the ones that are defined per se. Any questions to that? Nope, no questions so far. And yeah, let's finish the YAML structure. Um, so the remaining two fields are the ones that are necessarily per feature or necessarily per observation. So necessarily per feature are essentially gene IDs and gene symbols. So usually you'd be confronted with a scenario in which a count matrix was published with, uh, with ensemble IDs or a GNC or MGI symbols. So the symbol is the human readable form, like, um, yeah, P53. Um, whereas the ID is something like ENSG numeric identifier. You have one of the two. It doesn't matter for, uh, to us. It doesn't matter which one you have. You just have to tell us which one there is so that we can recognize where the genes lie. You also don't have to worry about capitalization. Um, we essentially take care of like mapping that to uh, a genome. Then for observation-wise, um, you'll see here that there's two groups that are either prefix with spatial or prefix with VDJ. These are again parts of our multimodal support. Both of these only need to be set if you have spatial data or VDJ data. And they allow you to describe for spatial data where the cell or the spotlight 
for VDJ data, what the VDJ chain looked like. So how the recombination events looked like in this set. Um, there's a bunch of documentation of this also specifically for Spatial and VDJ online. It's sort of rare um, and I'm not sure whether we encounter it today. So uh, we won't put a focus on describing it here now. Just be aware it's out there together with the layers before that gives us support for splice unsplice velocities, VDJ spatial um, attack also in the layers um, side also in, uh, defined per feature mostly, I think. Um, yeah. Now, so that was the YAML. Um, now the last component of the data loader is the um, IDTSV files. Um, these map serialize um, annotation of metadata to ontologies. So in the example before, we annotated the entire data set as bone marrow. Bone marrow is a symbol in the organ ontology Uberon that we're using. So setting this in the YAML um, establishes a perfect map to the ontology and we essentially done at that point. For the service metadata, um, so before a cell tab, right? There we set the um, prefix ops key item, which means that there is a column in the dot ops of the data that comes off the load that has the cell type labels in them. But now remember the load is the minimum viable piece of code you need to load a very unstructured form of the data. So that means that the cell types are not streamlined in there. The cell types have like some names. It's maybe like a lowercase t for a t cell or something like this. Similar for all of the ontology constraint metadata. Again, briefly mentioning SASC, cell type, development stage, disease, ethnicity, organ, organism, and sex. Um, so if you set any of these ops keys, um, our creation process um, builds for you these TSV files, one for each of them. Um, and we use these TSV files to map the free text labels that are defined in the data set to ontology labels, thus making this metadata useful for other people because it becomes searchable. Now we only generate these TSV files for OPSKI that are actually set. If none of your data, if none of your metadata is controlled per se, you'll have zero of these TSVs in your loader. If maybe a set, like maybe like a common scenario would be organ, assay, and cell type are defined per cell, then you'd have three TSV files. And yeah, we'll describe now how you get to the point that these two sweep files are established and how you mitigate them. So that's one for set type, for example. Um, this is the end product of a creation process. So this is how it looks like at the end. Um, there's the free text labels on the left. So the source IDs. So here maybe like a nice example is um, uh, second row from the bottom, the authors of this data set called a cluster or set type HSC which we believe to be the ontology label homotopoietic stem cell, which has a corresponding ontology ID, CL, bunch of zeros, and then three set. So um, this file has all of the unique free text labels that were defined, uh, that were used to define setups in this data set. And with this TSV file, we can map them to an ontology. Putting these maps into a TSV file makes it very easy to maintain. So let's say the ontology gets updated, um, the, low, the curation um, process can now just be repeated with an updated TSV file. We just have to like update the way the ontology calls this. So the target column, for example, or maybe somebody comes up with a more fine-grained map and finds that the HSC here is really a subcluster of hematopoietic stem cells in the ontology. We could easily update this here. It's human readable, so it's accessible to people who have um, no coding background even. So yeah, we believe that's very useful to get this um, iterative curation process to work that we described yesterday. Just for your reference, uh, one more. So this would be one that we established for the data set presented before for the sex metadata, um, where um, individuals were assigned to capital female or capital male in the data set. Uh, the way that PATO defines that, so the ontology uh, that is used to define this metadata is lowercase, and then there's an ontology ID for that. So that's a very easy one to build. 
Cool. So that's how a uh, data loader looks like. Um, this is what you want to build today, right? Um, if so, the more often you do this creation process, the more direct you can do it. You can just like at some point essentially just like copy over another data loader and just like modify it so that it fits your data. But um, in cases where the creation process may be a bit more complicated because there's lots of files around or um, if uh, you're not very uh, well adjusted to the creation process, um, we think that it's very helpful to have like additional guidance in creating these files that goes beyond a documentation page online that says, this is what a loader is, build all of these components. So for this reason, we build a CLI, which is a, well, it's short for a, a command line interface. And this command line interface establishes a stepwise walk through or towards um, a fully functional data loader. So essentially, you can use this CLI to break this process of writing these files down into individual steps um, and receive feedback and help in that process. In particular, these, so now here on the uh, left of the schematic, we see these four components, the init, that's always the same, then the pi, the YAML, and the TSV files. Step one creates these three files here, pi and YAML, and then the init. Step two creates these TSV files, and then step three sort of checks everything through. And then beyond that, the workflow would be from step three, you can publish the data loader to GitHub, or you can create a streamlined h 5 d files that you can upload somewhere. Now you notice that here the step one, or like phase one is substructured into two steps, A and B, and similar also phase two has also an additional uh, step two. So here essentially you run in the CI, so in a shell, you run Sphira create data loader. It guides you through, uh, through some steps and then it finishes. Um, and then you have to do some manual steps, like writing some Python code in the .py, so define the load function. And you have to define the um, remaining metadata in the YAML file that you may have not set in the um, CLI place. Similarly for annotate, um, so at this point here, you have the YAML and the Py, so the data object itself is described, but you don't have these TSV files yet. In step two, we create um, we create sort of like templates of how these TSP files should look like, which you then have to manually mitigate. So you have to manually choose uh, the best fit ontology terms. We help you with uh, fuzzy string matching, but you have to still um, manually create this. And then once you did that, here you're essentially done with the data loader. So then everything is finalized and checked and you're done. So we really recommend you to use this CLI to guide you through this creation process, um, especially also step two. Um, also, we always do step two in the CLI because this is just a giant, a really gigantic um, help in like making sure that you have all of the entries in there, for example. This really like really accelerates the process. And you can use this or the, using this CLI is independent also of whether you use a Conda environment or a Docker, for example. So you would use the same CLI in both cases. Now, uh, unless there's any questions, I'd now go through a bunch of like special cases that are not, yeah, special in the sense they're still relatively common, but they deviate from the base case where you write a single data loader. Um, is there anything there? Yeah, we just had a question in the chat, which I which I answered in text, but this is basically might be interesting for, for other people as well. So this is about um, how we do the ontology matching. So, you know, sometimes your cell type might not match perfectly um, in or is not perfectly represented in the ontology, in which case we uh, just take whatever coarser term is uh, is fitting. Um, in the ontology, um, and then there was uh, the other case where we do have a good fit, and there we just go as fine grained as possible um, in the in the ontology uh, graph to to label it. 
but otherwise, uh, no, no questions. Cool. Then let's go on to, yeah, so the special cases. Um, so the first one would be, um, you have a scenario in which you have multiple data files and you want to build one loader for all of these data files. So we handle this in a specific example case. So this was a data set issue that was posted to our GitHub. Um, you'll see that it was described that there's two locations of the data, so two geo repositories. So that's already the first clue, right? Like this is mostly multiple, uh, most likely multiple account matrices. Let's check them out. Like let's go to both of these um, geo repositories. This is the first one on the left and here on the right is the second one. You see that the first one has 17 samples. Um, so these donor uh, underscore 01, IPF underscore 01. They're all files inside of this tar file here. Um, here we have two samples, again, inside of a tar file. So totally we would have 19 samples here. So these two tar files would be the two download links that we define in the YAML. So downloading these tars gives us access to all of the data that was published for this study. Now a data loader would load all of these 19 objects. So you define it for 19 sample file names. Um, and you try to look for like shared data structure that you could um, share in the load function, for example. So most likely these are similar objects and then you could just repeat the Python load function for each of these objects. And this is exactly what your multi-file loader does. Important is though, to be able to recognize it, having multiple account matrices means that you have a multi-file loader with number of count messages, many uh, sample file names. If you have one very large coin matrix and you have sample annotation in there, right? That's sometimes the case for atlases. Um, maybe one coin matrix with half a million cells from 100 donors. Um, this is not a multi file loader. This is a single file loader. And you can just set the individual ops key, for example, in the metadata. Um, so, this what a file is or what a sample is, is really centered around the coin matrix. And it's really just about us being able. Um, to interact with the data well enough. Um, it doesn't influence um, your ability to annotate metadata. Uh, here's an example for um, how this does not affect your ability to annotate metadata. Uh, let's say we have similar case to before, but let's break it down a bit. We have two different car matrices. We annotate them as sample file names A and B. So it could be that they're called a.h5ad and b.h5ad on, on some Zenodo or Geo. Now, um, it may be the case that they both come from healthy individuals. So we could just say, um, here, remember, healthy is cross data set and healthy obski as per se. So defining this here means that healthy is true for all of the files controlled by this loader. Um, but it may be that these two uh, count matrices come from different organs of healthy individuals. So then uh, we can still define organ per data as a cross data set, right? It doesn't have to be defined per cell because it's constant over A and constant over B. So we can set up A as a dictionary essentially, which in YAML you would write like this here. You would take the name of the, of the sample file name A and B here without the parentheses. Um, and then colon lung and colon pancreas, which would be the uber on controlled so ontology controlled descriptors of anatomic location of sampling. Um, yeah, so this is it's desirable to do this here in a multi file loader. So this is um, better than using the ops key uh, because this doesn't generate a TSV file. So keeping it here means that there's more content in the YAML file which usually is easier for other people to read. It's easier for other people to correct. Um, also usually faster for you to write. So keep what you can in the YAML file using dictionaries if you do multi-file loading. Here's an example of how this load function could look like. Um, let's assume that these A and B were um, HF IDs. Um, so there's A, uh, would arrive at um, sample file name here in the load function. So you don't have to take care of that. This is all Sawyer backend. But what if this list of Sawyer file names, uh, this list of sample file names 
uh, would each be given as an argument to one call to load. So in the first call, we would have the location of all of the data and A. Um, now, um, let's say these files are called my file A HFID and my file B HFID. So I can read both of them with this code here, essentially. So this just repeated twice. And this is really nice, right? So like you have two files now, very simple code, and Sphero just repeats it for you in the loading process. You just have to write it once. Now, the example case that I showed before, right? There was 19 files. There's cases where it's like 100 files. So in all of these cases, you'll have like a handful of lines of Python code that's just repeated across these files as long as they're documented in a similar structure. So all of them are empty access, all of them are HFIDs, which is most commonly the case that people upload sort of similar files. Now, let's briefly talk about meta studies and atlases. So, to us, they're all meta studies, but I mean, commonly people also refer to them as atlases. Um, briefly, uh, what that means. So, let's assume that there's a study 10.1 on the right here, DOI 10.1, with two data sets, A1 and A2, and a study 10.2 uh, with a single data set, B1. Both are primary in the sense that both measured these cells and were the first to publish these con matrices. Now, um, I, would study, uh, I would build a meta study on Atlas based on um, data from both studies. Um, that would be a data set C1. It would be some subselection merger of these three here. This would not be primary data anymore under um, our schema. Um, and we could indicate the source of these cells using the source DOI metadata item that I highlighted in the YAML earlier. Um, so why do we do this? Um, this is nice because um, in a data collection, we can now avoid that we have replicate cells, right? Like, let's uh, imagine, for example, I want to write a store and like train models on it. Um, I could bias that store to particular cells if they're reused very often in meta studies or atlases, which is the case, right? Like some data sets are more oftenly reused in meta studies. So by defining this, uh, we can counter select that and that's fine. And then the second case, which moving on um, with more people using this, we um, hope to achieve is that when you start creating the meta study, so when you embark on the journey of um, writing study 10.3 here, you directly start with data loaders 10.1 and 10.2, right? Because the data is already curated there. The process of generating an atlas is gonna be much easier for you if you just start from Spire curated raw data um, or your primary data. Um, so then, then you have this additional part when, where not only can you define in your final atlas H5ID object where stuff came from, but also sort of like at the beginning of the notebook, you'd be able um, to just directly call the curated data from Sphere and have like a very reproducible pipeline that goes to the Atlas object. So meta studies and atlases, you can add them to Sphere. You add them the same way to Sphere as other objects, but there's two additional metadata to set primary data and primary, sorry, source data, source DOI. Now curating setup annotation, um, that's often like a bit laborious and probably uh, one of the steps later that takes you the most time, but very worthwhile doing because it's one of the most commonly accessed metadata items by data consumers. Um, I think all of you have a good intuition of what it means to map cell types to the ontology at this point. Um, we have again an example of a TSV file that accomplishes this on the right. Um, here on the left, um, a few sort of like minor complications or like um, food for thought essentially for your own curation project later. Um, it does happen for a bunch of cell types that the free text search that so the search against the ontology that we do uh, doesn't capture the free text label very well. So essentially the suggestions that you get are not ideal. This is because the cell ontology is very big and if um, the free text label is some abbreviation that's not in that ontology, then it's very hard to find. Sometimes it makes sense to then just go into the paper um, 
look up this like three letter abbreviation of a cell type and then usually they would describe it as a like longer like full name somewhere and then look at this cell type and the ontology and just like see if you find an ontology fit there so they're often you'd have like the ontology website that we're going to mention later open and sort of just like compare your hits um, that you get here as uh, shortlisted sort of against um, ones that you manually look up. Sometimes you have free text labels that contain nested annotation. Common case is um, there is multiple samples and one of them was lower quality and then a class was assigned as T sets, whereas in the other samples um, they distinguish C4 and CD8 T sets. Now, um, each of these T cells, CD4 T cell and CD8 T cell would uh, appear as rows here. So these are all uh, labels to map to the ontology and you can just map them to the most well fit ontology label. So in these cases, there would also be a label for general T cell, which is a parent label of CD4 and CD8 plus T cells. So that essentially, if you have nested annotation in the free text, like no problem, just like choose the best fit for each of them. Um, now, sometimes free text types contain several phenotypes that map badly to the ontology. Could be that there's like a cycling B cell in there, or it could be a marker gene positive negative T cell. Um, sometimes, um, if you look through the ontology, you can, and if you know the system, you can sort of like figure out uh, which ontology label or like ontology like sub label this refers to. Uh, often, you can also just ignore it. If it's like, um as something positive fibroblast and fibroblast is already like a very specific label in, in the ontology then you can also just like map it to fibroblast it's definitely a good first guess sort of right and then creation is an iterative uh, process much better to put out a reasonable um like first approximation of the creation than no creation at all um yeah free text labels are more fragment in the ontology that's mostly the case if you have like marker gene positive, like five different subclusters of something. Mostly that ends up being activation states and those are not reflected in the ontology largely. So you can just scrap that part then and map them all to the same ontology level. Very rarely there may be a new cell type annotated in free text. That is actually not in the ontology, but it should be. Chances are the ontology consortium is already working on that in that case. It is very rare. Um, essentially, just leave it an issue of GitHub if you were to encounter this. I think like last year, that was the case once for the one lung cell type that was newly discovered, but this is a rare case. Like I would first go into it again and check that this is really not just like a weird synonym of another cell type that is already annotated. Um, so another a uh, specific part of these load function is that you quite often need to read compressed files because the load function operates directly on the downloaded objects to make this maximally reproducible. Um, often they are like tar compressed or GZ compressed. We have a bunch of code snippets online in the documentation page that I shared um, with examples of how you would read from a particular compressed object in Python. Here, so here, for example, there's one for how you read from a tar archive essentially just like use the normal pandas function inside of this with type file open as tar. So usually it's pretty easy. Just let us know if you have issues there. Similar R files. Again, load needs to load whatever you have into uh, a data instance, right? So if that's an R file, you essentially need to run R code in Python, which is possible with undata to RRA, for example. So here's an example uh, that essentially runs native R code inside of a Python script. Um, Heavily recommend to use the Docker if, you, um, if your objects are RDS or any R objects because the Docker has a um, R installation and a Python installation that cooperate already there for you. Um, and setting this up locally may be difficult depending on like how Python R savvy you are. But yeah, roughly this is what it looks like. Let us know if you have that case and we'll help you with writing this R code. Multimodal briefly mentioned this along the way where you would set this in YAML. The stuff that we support is RNA, obviously, and it's very somewhat centered on RNA because single cell RNA seq is the dominant driver of like the single cell 
revolution of cell biology, arguably. Most of the samples are single cell anastic in any case. Then at HUC, um, we support via feature, uh, feature type metadata, similar site seek or any protein measurement, also via feature type. Special resupport, so that could also be Visum, so it doesn't even need to be um, single cell resolved, like segmented Murphish. Um, then splice space, unspliced, and velocities, we support through layers. And then lastly, BDJ, so any uh, immune cell receptor reconstruction that is measured in addition to other molecular properties of the cell. So for example, think of joint single cell and ASIC with TCR profiling or BCR profiling for B cells. Um, so there we describe these um, chain uh, rearrangements. One, before we move to session one, one last one I wanted to raise, um, continuing from a question that was raised yesterday about how one can deal with embryonic data. Um, this is actually a difficult question, but it fits into this context here. Um, so the key metadata to, con uh, to consider in embryo embryonic data are mostly probably the cell type, the tissue, and the developmental stage. The developmental stage should be somewhat straightforward because you usually know age of the embryo, essentially. Tissue is largely also covered in Uberon. I think also if it's sort of like these embryonic layers that are like premature tissues, um, check it out in Uberon, so our anatomic location um, ontology, but it's probably covered. And then cell type can be really difficult. Like, if this is a not fully differentiated cell type that only exists in Uberon, it may not be um, in cell ontology. Um, there, I would just recommend choose the best sort of like umbrella cell type term that, that fits whatever you have there. Um, it, it can be very straightforward um, for like, yeah, um, older samples, but for very early embryogenesis, that may be like very hard to reflect in cell ontology. And they're just, Think about like why do you map stuff to an ontology to make it findable, right? Um, yeah, if this is like a very rare case, um, you just want to map it to like a broader term so that somebody who does a very broad search will find it, um, right? And that's that's all you want. Like the raw met, so the raw annotation is still then the object. Like somebody who loads it can still just directly go to whatever label. Um, a developmental biologist assigned to this cell and like work specifically on this data set like that. Um, but these like larger queries, uh, they should be enabled for broad terms. Yeah. And this is all we do with this ontology matching. <laughs>